I'm going to be introducing to you Dennis Wang, our Senior Vice President of Design here at Niantic. He has been with us from very early days. He was lead designer on Pokemon Go and as such has spent a lot of time thinking about the intricacies and complications of designing in designing software in a like real world context. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Dennis to come on up. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining, joining me here. Um, the, early on the programming said it would, this would be a fireside chat and I imagine we might have some synthetic fire thing and lots of chairs, but when I looked at the agenda and uh, saw how some, some of you coming from faraway places, I thought maybe I could pivot the, the talk at the last minute a little bit to uh, talk a little bit more about some of the more practical, uh, tangible insights and lessons and learnings uh, that that I was exposed to over working at Niantic over many years. Um, uh, when I started at Google, when Google was still a startup, I never imagined I'd be so fortunate to cross paths with John Hankey, who's, who's the, the, uh, the, the soul and visionary for all things Niantic. And when we started the Niantic Labs team, uh, never did I imagine we'd be designing uh, experiences intended for the Google Glass and the Apple Watch and trying to get people off their couch and into the real world and dreaming big, engaging with each other. Uh, and uh, it's been just an, an incredible journey uh, tackling this uh, uh, location-based and AR experiences. Um, and it's not always easy, but when you get it right, uh, things like this can happen. Uh, this was, I think, around 2016 or 17 uh, for Ingress. Um, and players from all over Japan and all over the world congregating and playing together outdoors. Uh, there's just, it, it's nothing, uh, there's nothing quite like it. Once you can experience uh, creating experiences like this that uh, brings people together, um, it's, it's just a very addictive thing and you just, I'm going to keep trying again and again. Uh, Pokemon Go is the same way. But designing apps for the real world, uh, big AR experiences, it's not quite simple. It's not always intuitive. So today I'm hoping to talk a little bit about some of the interaction design and visual design uh, insights that I've been um, thinking a lot about over the years. So, Thinking big, big AR experiences outdoors, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a different mindset than designing for uh, uh, indoors, more focused experiences that are maybe more precise, maybe a bit more um, uh, solo. And a big, uh, big learning for me personally has been all about uh, not dropping your phone, not exposing players to danger, moving people with intentional, uh, with intention. Uh, so it comes to it, when it comes to uh, visual design, uh, you're having to consider things that you normally don't have to fight too much, like the sun, the bright sunlight. How does that impact uh, your the usability and, and uh, accessibility? Uh, of, uh, when you're holding the phone and you're always in motion, moving. Uh, moving from bus stop to your workplace, back to home. What are gestures that feel comfortable and more intuitive? These are, these are kind of obvious things, but when you start to design for the outdoors more, uh, it's, it's helpful always to uh, have a development process that is not about sitting in front of uh, an editor on your desktop at, at the office space. It's all about playtesting outdoors and trying to come up with your own sort of principles and own sort of uh, uh, know-how because this is a pretty cutting edge space. And as developers uh, in this space, we're gonna have to figure things out together. So again, at the risk of pointing out a lot of obvious things, when we first started uh, building uh, experiences like uh, Pokemon Go and Ingress, we quickly found out that the, the 
the interaction design for even simple things like menus and buttons, we found that the more you allow the player to kind of hold on to the phone in a secure fashion, the, the better it is. Uh, and so usually that means avoiding these awkward, having to reach the top uh, far away places of the corners of the device. Phones have gotten quite big over the years. And so uh, keeping the core controls close to your thumb, whether you're left-handed, whether you're right-handed, that a lot of those obvious insights heavily influenced all of our choices uh, for a, a very popular title like Pokemon Go. Uh, so the color highlighted on the left, like the, your kind of range of motion and reachability for the left thumb and the right thumb, that sort of sweet spot at the lower center, those are kind of the places that we uh, try to stay uh, when, when placing the most important set of controls for our apps. And beyond the menus uh, for the map views, you can also see all of the frequently accessed uh, UI elements are kept to the, kept to the bottom uh, where you can hold on to the phone uh, in, in comfortable ways. And the, and the gestures are less about these precision taps, these like windows, X is always on the upper right or, or the upper left um, corners of windows. Those don't tend to work very well when you're trying to speed walk uh, and uh, get those footsteps counts up. Uh, for, so for us, it's all about these big, generous tap targets, swipes. Uh, even when you're not looking at your phone, these building, the ability to build muscle memory so that you can sort of glance really quickly, pay attention, fully engaged with the real world, and uh, you're able to navigate the full range of experience uh, in these apps. So those are really important uh, concepts for us. And on the visual design side, fighting the sun is, is a pretty difficult problem. Uh, back when I was uh, helping do the visual design for Ingress, the display tech on phones weren't very good. So with, whether it was light on dark or dark on light actually started to really make a big difference when it came to uh, visibility and whether you could see and read something. So these choices really mattered uh, when playtesting outside. While the screens have gotten pretty good, uh, and they're pretty um, legible. Elements are still legible uh, with the, the latest and greatest screen technologies. I think it's still really important that every element you're considering the information hierarchy and the most important things are the ones that the user can easily grok and focus on. So color contrast uh, and uh, also special consideration for uh, the context of where the users will be. Is it nighttime? Do they want to be blinded by a full screen of really bright stuff? Probably not, so you have to uh, uh, you know, either tap into the OS's dynamic dark mode kind of logic, or at least at a minimum providing some setting uh, uh, so that the user has some control. Those are all uh, great practices to consider. Uh, I don't know how this is translating, but one, one useful tip is uh, using the perceived lightness value set, uh, values as a guide for considering contrast beyond uh, just uh, what we normally think of as contrast of uh, lightness differences. Actually, I think this is a typo. I meant to write perceived lightness from lab color, not luminous, but uh, in Photoshop, there's like a lab color value that you can use, the big L value. And what I'm trying to say here is that even though like in this example, green and red are some of the high contrast uh, opposites, it's still hard to read because the L values are tuned to be very similar to each other. So pay attention to the lightness of uh, everything so that the most important screen elements are uh, easy, easy to see, easy to read. And at least in the current gen uh, mode of AR, you can't ever predict what's in the real world and what's gonna be shown on the camera feed. So uh, another obvious point, but 
uh, being uh, uh, considerate and how you tune the screen elements so that it, it can be legible even against uh, light or dark uh, camera feed elements. Just some practical ways of dealing with screen, sc screen space elements. So you can have different containers, different shaders. Uh, so uh, there are many ways to handle uh, this, this uh, challenge. So one thing about human perception and attention, uh, I learned this when I was at Google, when, when trying to design uh, the, uh, the Google homepage. Even though the Google homepage is like super simple, there's not that much elements on the screen. But every time we added some important element to it, people still didn't uh, often catch it. Like we would have, you know, the logo and the search box, but then when we would like add different like uh, tabs to it or different functionalities, rarely did people recognize that those elements were even there. Like their eyes went straight to the to the search box. Um, there's a bit of that like uh, one thing at a time uh, mindset that we all get into. Like per screen, there's sort of that dominant thing that uh, grabs all your attention and everything is sort of lost in the peripheral vision. Um, there's a lot of things that, uh, in app experience design that you have to really consider. And it's easier said than done. When you tr fight for attention at any moment, you almost have to assume that the, the user is going to just see one thing at a time. So at the screen space, if you're, if you're calling out some important, uh, important message, and then in the, in the 3D scene, something else important is going on, that com competition for attention, the, the, the user is only going to see one thing. So again, uh, this is easier said than done, but you have to be really judici judicious in how you design the experience and the sequencing of the event system so that uh, you're not competing for attention. And this comes in a lot when you're thinking about screen space elements and world space elements. So if you're demanding the user to kind of read something, but then there's something important happening behind it, so you have to kind of see through the message and try to grok two things at the same time, it's, usually not a good, um, a reliable way to interact with the user. Um, and here's an example of a more world space kind of call out. And this tends to work a lot better uh, when it comes to AR. But of course, the challenge is sometimes not uh, so simple. You can't always have all the stuff on the, screens, uh, 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 on the screen when it's world space. So uh, devs have to sometimes come up with some hybrid uh, tricks to uh, keep things uh, visible or findable and kind of glue it to the screen space even though it's um, not, not, not a fixed uh, screen space element. Uh, switching topics a little bit about uh, interaction design. Does, does anyone recognize what this screenshot's from, by the way? It's a... Uh, it's that uh, pulse meter thing from the movie Aliens. Uh, so when aliens are kind of detected, uh, the, the characters are holding this and is telling you, oh, there's an alien nearby. So in the early days of Pokemon Go, we learned very quickly that interactions that do this sort of hot or cold abstract, abstract representation of uh, whether it's close to something or not is a challenging um, uh, model to, to orient and help the users navigate. It's counterintuitive because things like compass and maps and radars, those are all uh, seemingly intuitive uh, uh, navigation aids that we see all around us. Um, but this is a very specific point about what we've learned at Niantic about vectoring. So if you do this hot or cold thing, we've learned that your cognitive side of your brain sort of disengages and sort of the, 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 uh, the more primitive part of our brain 
uh, activates. And so you end up doing this sort of, oh, is my pinging getting faster or slower? And, and you, you kind of step into the direction that you're looking for because the visuals are abstract. You might not be fully aware of your surroundings when, you, when your body sort of moves in that direction. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, specific uh, case, but when you have the combination of this one-dimensional vectoring and an abstract representation of you're getting closer, farther away, hot, cold, this sort of aliens uh, pinging, it's a, it's a, uh, it, should, it should raise a flag and see if there's a better way to do it. So for us in Pokemon Go, one way to get around this issue and to engage your more cognitive side of your brain is to have the map representation, have a pin. And so that's, that's one way to get around it where then the user's mindset is a lot more about, oh, okay, I have to, I have to get from here to there. I'm gonna cross the street over there, turn right, and then I'm at the destination that I want. So again, a pretty simple, obvious uh, insight, but it's a really important one. Um, it, it has to do with player safety and engaging and moving people with intentionality. Uh, so it's all about that. And other tricks that we're gonna have to figure out together is like that awareness of the surrounding. How much are we able to guide the user so that even if they are interacting in AR, with the current gen mobile devices. Like how much of it uh, is gonna be blocking your vision? How much of it is going to uh, you know, play with the real world and the f uh, physical surroundings in a transparent way uh, so that you're um, uh, balancing that need for immersion and storytelling versus uh, giving the user context and awareness about their physical environment. So the example on the left, you can kind of have a more natural, intuitive interaction with uh, the objects and the physical reality. Um, but it's a little bit, it breaks, that, um, it breaks that sense of immersion, like stuff is kind of fading in and out. On the right side, uh, it's a bit more of the, the characters are a lot more tangible and engaging, uh, but it, it cuts the user uh, a little bit more in an isolating way. So these are different approaches that uh, we're constantly experimenting uh, at Niantic to see what works depending on the context. There's no uh, one, one size fits all solution obviously, but with all of the teams uh, that you're part of, I hope that um, uh, these types of experiments and creative uh, journey, we can take, take these explorations together. And again, yeah, when you get this right, uh, huge, uh, amazing things can happen. And I hope that uh, you'll think about uh, all the physical limitations of holding the phone up for a long time. There's, uh, uh, you know, hopefully with the VPS locations, all of us can figure out the right cadence of how long of an experience feels uh, uh, more intuitive and comfortable but then you're then able to let the hand down by your side, walk through the space, get to the next waypoint, but have something fun and lightweight to do along the way. Uh, there's definitely a lot of different, uh, inf maybe infinite ways to craft the user experience so that uh, this blend of storytelling and, and the virtual experience uh, is balanced with the, the accessibility and what's comfortable, what's safe. Uh, and uh, what's engaging is, is going to be a wild ride. Uh, so I hope, hope that you're excited about this future as much as I am. And uh, it's, uh, yes, there's so much to figure out. I, I'm really excited to um, take this journey with all of you together. So that's, that's it for today, thank you. I think we have time for uh, some questions, if, if any of the topics if you wanted to ask. Yes, please.
Yeah, so the question is about uh, how much detail uh, is appropriate uh, for the map when, when helping, the, helping the user navigate through the real world. Um, I, I think it really depends on the context. Um, if, if you have a map where the player has to spend a lot of moments figuring out the orientation and where am I, uh, like let's say the, the streets have no, no text labels like in a lot of the, the apps that we have out there so far. It isn't necessarily a great thing because it's friction. You're, you're having to like do these awkward like figuring out in the middle of the street. So it doesn't feel great. Uh, I think some of the technical constraints are really the excuse why we haven't really pushed the boundaries on a full intuitive map. Um, but that said, if you go overboard with uh, like a Google or Apple Maps level of functionality, it, it can uh, fight some of the immersion and the storytelling that you're trying to do. Because at the end of the day, whether it's a utilitarian kind of app or whether it's like a game or whether it's a fitness app, like you're always trying to tell that story. You're trying to uh, engage the user through, through that experience in an, as immersive of a way as possible. And so it's, it's a, almost a creative decision that you're trying to balance with the, the practical utilitarian decision. Uh, so no, no uh, single answer, but, um, but I, I think the, the easier it is to find your place, figure out where you're looking, and then be able to kind of map that in your head and then put your phone to the side and kind of start heading there, that those, are, those are great uh, moments to think about. Hope that answers a bit of your question. Any other uh, any other questions? Yes, please. In the same sort of session as uh, like avoiding vectoring, it's nice to uh, it seems like a Pokemon Go that uh, you guys chose to use using a map um, can be related to. If you don't have enough screen space to say uh, show an entire map, is there any alternatives to that that you've seen work well? So we have a lot of experiments going on at Niantic. I think one of the talks later today or tomorrow will be showcasing one of the experiments that uh, our team has done to help guide a player to a place, to a VPS activated place. And the big difference in, in the example you'll see then is that we're using the, uh, the camera view always. So no map, but it's all about using the compass and GPS and all the gyro, like all of the senses available to the phone device to be able to quickly give the player a sense of, oh, that, that I see this like glowing kind of directional, really easy to understand kind of heading. But it's not like the abstract example of having to look at this pulsing thing or like a mini radar pulse thing where it's gonna grab all my attention, wipe my peripheral vision, you know, my trip on a stairs, like that kind of mode. So having the camera on, uh, having other sort of really easy to glance visual signals to see um, how far away I am, uh, where I should be walking towards, those are some techniques I think has, that have a lot of potential. So. Yes, please. Um, sorry, can you ask the question again? Yeah, it really just has to do with like, how to conduct user research for geospatial games mm -hmm. where the user has to be out and about for the most part mm -hmm. to be really experiencing it, mm -hmm. uh, even though you want to be seeing their live reactions to their experience. Got it. Yeah, it does take some creative uh, tricks to, to, do you, to, do you, to observe users and uh, to gather um, qualitative data from playtest sessions uh, when, when the players are out there walking around. Um, so one example of how Niantic uh, dealt with this was uh, one of our partner studios developed a sort of a custom rig 
that is like a small backpack and cameras and uh, basically we ask the test subject to wear this thing while they're uh, holding the phone and they're uh, play testing. And so what gets sent back to the command and control center is the screen information of what's on there, uh, all of their audio, uh, and I think we all have, uh, have them wear a head-mounted camera as well. So it's a little bit fancy, but it doesn't have to be fancy. Like avail devices available today, you can easily kind of rig up something similar where uh, you get really high quality information, ask the subject to talk out loud as they're using something. Um, and you, if you record that, you can um, uh, 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 distribute the learnings to your team uh, afterwards, after some analysis. So that's sort of real time monitoring we've, we've tried before. Uh, sometimes just walking with the test subject uh, with uh, you know, with, with the researcher would just walk along with the test subject. That, that's always uh, uh, a really effective way to deal with that. So it's a little bit high maintenance, but uh, uh, there are some workarounds there. Any other questions? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, I don't know if we've solved that one ourselves satisfactorily. One thing I can say is you don't want to do that too dynamically, too quickly. Uh, uh, you can easily imagine someone losing their balance if they're so into it, then they're trying to track some really fast moving things. So when I say like move people with intention, it definitely includes that scenario of trying to track something out of your phone. So in, I guess maybe not the most satisfying thing, but you do have to like um, put a cap to how fast objects can move about around you. Um, and you know, I think some sort of like, like so in Peridot, the, the game that John uh, talked about, they have a dynamic sort of a rubber band arrow marker that helps you kind of orient and it's, it's going to kind of guide you to where the creature is at. So if it's off screen, then you get this uh, line guiding, guiding light uh, that's curving around you to kind of help you spot it. So I guess that, that, that's working pretty great so far. So I guess we do have some examples of how to deal with that. But uh, again, caution to not have that character move around too fast um, uh, for player safety reasons. Any other questions? Oh, well, thank you again for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Have a great rest of the conference.